um, from our side. So hello and welcome everyone to this joint skill, skill sharing session on the EBA Tools Navigator and the Panorama Solutions for a Healthy Planet um, initiative. My name is Luise Richter and I am working for the BMU ICI funded global project on mainstreaming ecosystem based adaptation, short EBA. Um, you will hear that more often throughout this session, um, which is a project implemented um, by GIZ. In our project, which focuses on providing tools and information on EBA for the people who implement it around the globe, I also manage a thematic community on EBA at the Panorama Initiative, which we will talk about a little later. I will facilitate the session today, um, but as mentioned before, this is a joint session by GIZ and the UN Environment Program World Conservation Monitoring Center. It is uh, really great to have you all here. Um, I can see there's still people coming in um, and we really look forward to interesting inputs and lively discussions uh, with all of you who are here with us. And um, during these next 60 minutes, we would like to, let me see if I can move forward. Yes, um, first introduce you to the EBA Tools Navigator. Um, Tanya uh, will go more into this. Um, afterwards, we wanna present the Panorama Solutions for a Healthy Planet um, platform and initiative. Um, and then we also want to get a solution provider's perspective um, by someone who's actually uploaded and provided a solution to Panorama. And afterwards, um, we will dive into comments and questions um, with all of you. But before we dive in, um, I would like to make some technical remarks. Um, we would kindly ask all of you to mute, mute yourselves and turn off your videos for the duration of the webinar, except of course, if you're speaking or presenting and you're also very welcome to, towards the end, um, bring your questions forward yourselves if you prefer doing that or if we have some backup um, questions um, to what you asked. Um, however, this does of course not mean that you cannot actively contribute to this session. Um, we would also kindly ask you to put all your questions and comments into the chat function and we will get back to these afterwards. Um, the session will be recorded and published um, after, after we have completed it. Um, so if you do not want to be recorded, this would uh, be probably the moment where you'd have to leave. Um, otherwise, um, yeah, you will be on um, the recording um, at, as a participant and it will be available for you to watch afterwards. And if you have any technical problems, please let us know via the chat. Um, and then we will do our best um, to help you all out um, with your issues. With this, I would like, hand, like to hand over to Tanya Savatera from, from UNEP WCMC to show us the EBA Tools Navigator. Tanya works on promoting the uptake of ecosystem-based adaptation by developing guidance and tools to support those who design and implement EBA and helping them making informed decision. The Tools Navigator is one of those resources that people have available and Tanya will now tell us all about it. Tanya, over to you. Thanks, Louisa. I will now share my screen with you all. Okay, so the EBA Tools Navigator, let's see what this is all about. So at its core, the Navigator is a database of tools and methods that are relevant for EBA. And it also contains a collection of examples and tool applications. And it has been designed to help users find the most appropriate tools and methods to support their EBA work, and also to help uh, understand which gaps uh, exist in terms of current av availability or accessibility of tools. So the Navigator was developed through a collaboration between two wiki projects. Um, the first one, the e e ecosystem-based approaches to climate change adaptation, strengthening the evidence and informing policy project, which, which was coordinated by IID, ICN, and us at uh, UNEP WCMC, and also the project mainstreaming ecosystem-based adaptation, strengthening EBA in planning and decision-making processes, which was coordinated by our colleagues at GIZ. Both uh, 
Both of these projects uh, aim to show policymakers and practitioners uh, when and why EBA is effective, so which conditions under which it works and the benefits, costs and limitations of EBA approaches. And they also aim to promote the better integration of EBA principles into policy and planning. So during these projects, one of the barriers to the wider uptake of EBA that was identified was the availability and accessibility of tools, uh, as well as general technical knowledge on EBA. And practitioners we spoke to were calling for more tools. But actually, an initial inventory we did of tools for EBA found that many tools were already available, and we found initially over 200 of them. So we thought that the need actually lies in making these tools more accessible rather than making more tools. And this doesn't mean that there are absolutely no gaps, but uh, we could uh, kind of recycle tools that can be used uh, in one area and use it in other contexts. And this is why we created the Navigator. So what uh, what is the content of this navigator? So at the moment we have over 240 tools or methods. Uh, the tools cover most stages of EBA, so from planning stages to assessment, uh, design, implementation, monitoring, or mainstreaming. Uh, most tools are also available at various scales, so they can be applied from local to municipal to national or regional scales. The tools can also be used by a range of users, and this includes project planners, managers, as well as policy makers. Uh, most tools are available in English, although we have a few available also in other languages. Uh, most tools are also open access, which means you can use them without paywalls or other restrictions. And they are, most of the tools we have are also quite general, so they can be applied to a range of ecosystems and uh, contexts. Um, we also have some tools that are designed for specific ecosystem types. So, for example, we have around 26 tools that have been designed specifically for marine or coastal ecosystems. But uh, as I mentioned, in general, most tools are, are quite, uh, quite broad and can be applied to a range of uh, ecosystem types and contexts. So, just to give you an idea of some examples, of uh, marine and coastal EBA tools we have at, uh, right now in the navigator. Uh, some examples include the Reef Resilience Toolkit, which was developed by the Reef Resilience Network. Uh, and this is an online platform with the different resources and materials to help uh, project managers address impacts of climate change and uh, threats to coral reefs. We also have the Changing Tides Climate Adaptation Methodology for Protected Areas developed by WWF, uh, which describes an approach for developing climate adaptation measures in coastal and marine protected areas. And another example is the Guide to Coastal EPA Options and Coastal EPA Decision Support Tool, which was developed by UNEP. And this one can help support with the selection, design, implementation and evaluation of different options for, for coastal EBA. So we had a look at what types of tools are present in this navigator. So let's now have a quick look at what are the functionalities and how it works. So at the moment, the navigator exists in an Excel format, although we are developing an improved online version over the coming months. In this current Excel version, we have two main components. Uh, the first one is a database where all the tools and methods are listed and where we can also search for tools. And we also have a collection of examples of tool application where users have reported their own experiences using tools. But the most useful function is its search interface. Uh, and this allows you to find tools for specific needs by cust customizing your search uh, according to different criteria. For example, you can search according to the ecosystem you're working on, uh, the scale of implementation you want to use, or you can also search according to the, the stage of EBA you, you need a tool for, whether it's at planning stages, uh, design, monitoring and evaluation, or mainstreaming. And then 
by searching the database, the navigator will create a customized list of results for you, which more or less looks like this. So in the results generated, uh, you will be given information about each of the tools that fit your search. So you can see here an example of a few results that come up when we search for tools that are relevant for marine or coastal ecosystems. And we are given a detailed information, for example, on the complete name of the tool, which institutions or organizations develop the tool, what stages the tool can be applied in. Uh, there's also a link, of course, so you can access the actual tool online. Um, a description of what the tool does, uh, what kind of users it's been tailored for, at what scale it can be used, uh, any resources or trainings needed to use the tool, if it's open access or not, and also what language is, is, um, it's available in. And some tools, not all of them though, uh, will have um, a link that takes you to user experiences. So this is feedback that people have provided on which context and how it how it was like to use a particular tool. So in the user example section, you will be able to see where the tool was used and in what type of project, uh, as well as who were the institutions implementing it and uh, why uh, the tool was chosen. Uh, and you also see feedback on how the tool was used and reviews of the experiences uh, that people had when they were using the tool. So for example, this could include feedback on um, if additional expertise and resources were needed to use the tool, how easy it was to use it, uh, people's opinions on what the, the strengths or advantages of using that particular tool, uh, and also feedback on limitations people found when using the tool. Um, so this is just a short uh, overview. There's actually a lot more feedback people can give, uh, but this is just to give you an idea of uh, uh, some examples you can find there. So, so that was a short overview of the current version of the Excel Navigator and what it looks like. And at the moment, we are actually preparing to develop an online version <coughs> where the search functions will be improved and which will be more user-friendly and have a nicer design. And this is a screenshot of the prototype of the online navigator, which we are not able to share at the moment, but I will explain what we are envisioning. So, so the principles of using the, the online navigator will be similar <coughs> to, to the ones I just explained for the Excel version. So, there will be a search function where you can select different search criteria uh, and search for specific tools. And after choosing this, uh, the navigator will give you a list of tools relevant to the criteria you prefer. So similarly to what I mentioned before, uh, you will then get a list of results with links to the tool, detailed information, as well as links to user experiences. <coughs> so, because the tool is actually for you and for other potential users, we would really like you to, to contribute and to help us uh, design the most useful tool now that we are still kind of in the drawing board stages of developing the new online version. So, so we would like to know, uh, and we would like to give us your opinion on what features you'd like to see in the online, online navigator. So for example, is there a particular search criteria that, you, that it would be useful for you to find tools more efficiently? Also, what features would encourage you to engage and contribute to the navigator? So maybe you have specific uh, ideas to make it more user friendly and accessible. And because we also want this to be a tool that people can contribute to, so how could we make it easy for you to either add new tools or contribute with your own tool experiences. And finally, if you know of any new tools developed recently for ABA uh, and that you'd like to see featured in the Navigator, or maybe you'd like to give your own feedback on, um, on your experiences with a particular tool, we would also really welcome your input. So we have created a mirror board where you can add your feedback on these three questions. And uh, the link has been posted on the, on the message board. 
uh, I posted it earlier. And uh, so you can go to the link and send, uh, give us your feedback on the post-it notes. And if you prefer, of course, you can also send your input via email. Uh, you're very welcome to do either of these options. So that's it for me. I welcome you to share your ideas. We would highly appreciate them. And now I pass on to my colleagues to continue with the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tanya. Um, again, um, questions and comments uh, are very welcome in the chat. Um, and we'll get back to them towards the end of the this session. Um, I would now like to hand over to my colleague Tilanka Zeneviratne, who works for the global project Blue Solutions, which is a project that focuses on capacity building and global knowledge exchange linked to several topics relevant in the conservation and sustainable use of the resources that, that come with marine and coastal biodiversity. It is implemented by GIZ, Grid Arendal, IUCN, and UN Environment, and funded by BMU and the International Climate Initiative. Um, Tilanka, and, Tilanka and her team also manage a thematic community on Panorama, and she will now introduce us to what Panorama actually is. So Tilanka, the floor is yours. Thank you, Louisa, for that introduction. So I am going to share my screen now. Please let me know if you, if you can't see it. Um, yeah, so as Luisa said, I will talk a little bit about Panorama and what, what we do and um, what our approach is. So what is Panorama? Um, Panorama Solutions for a Healthy Planet is a partnership initiative which facilitates learning from success in conservation and natural resource management. So what we do is we document, collate, and promote examples of inspiring and replicable solutions that showcase how nature conservation can benefit society. So it's all about enabling cross-sectoral learning and upscaling of successes, um, and also giving recognition to solution providers. So we want to connect pr practitioners, and Panorama can also be a source of stories for conservation communicators, for example, and they can also inform research policy and help to understand current, current trends, trends on what's going on in the world. So our motto really is that we want to stop reinventing the wheel and learn from what is already working on the ground. So here's a quick background um, on our institutional um, setup. Um, so Panorama, currently seven global partner organizations from conservation and sustainable development are coordinating and developing Panorama. And these are GIZ, IUCN, Grid Arendal, uh, UNEP, RARE, IFORM, and UNDP. And uh, GIZ is the German Co uh, Development Cooperation and IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, are um, organizing the Secretariat of Panorama. So as you can see here, we have seven, uh, seven thematic communities, and these are structured in the, into themes, and they are mainly organized uh, in this way for organizational reasons. And these themes, or thematic communities as we call them, are managed and coordinated by one or several institutions. So as Luisa has already pointed out, I am part of Blue Solutions, and we coordinate the marine and coastal thematic community and Luisa is part of the ecosystem-based adaptation thematic community. Panorama is constantly growing and we are adding um, collaborating partners to our portfolio and also adding thematic communities. For example, we have recently added the nature and culture thematic community. So why are we focusing on what works on the ground? Sometimes we get asked why our focus lays on, on finding what is already working and what people are doing instead of looking for barriers and looking at the problems and seeing what is not working and how we can improve. But our mindset is that uh, while it is really important to identify challenges and barriers, people and mostly practitioners in our sector, they are well aware of the challenges. And what is sometimes lacking is a way forward and showing optimistic success stories from the ground experiences. So if you think about it, you can ask yourself, what inspires you? And for us, it is concrete action for taking action 
in tackling current issues and learning and listening to people who, are, who have been doing it for decades and who have been part of the solution and can, us, they can tell us something about, about their work on the ground. So while it is important to learn from failure, seeing how others have successfully tackled a challenge and understanding concrete solutions inspires us and makes, makes us feel empowered to do the same thing maybe in another region. So how does it work in practice? Um, we can have at the, a look at this infographic, which is quite a holistic approach to our solutioning format. So it all starts with the solution provider, and this is the person who has a solution at hand. So they have a case study or best practice, practice which they have been practicing on the ground, and they would like to share that to the wider community. And they then come to Panorama and we document it together in a standardized template. And this has been tested and refined over the years by Panorama. And then the aim of documenting the case study or solution in this template is to identify replicable core components that um, made this approach successful. So these core components of the solutions, we call them building blocks. And these building blocks really aim to identify common elements that generated success. So the solution with its building blocks then gets fed into a searchable global database and is published onto Panorama and then fed into one of the thematic communities or maybe, uh, maybe several ones if they have overlapping content. Um, and then on the other side, you have the solution seeker. And this is someone who is in need of a solution or in need of inspiration and is looking for practices um, and lessons learned from other practitioners, which they can, they can um, implement in their own context. Um, so really for the solution provider, it's all about increasing leverage and the impact of their work visibly through our platform, um, which is backed by well-known and credible organizations. So it gives them recognition for the good work that they are doing. And in the years of gathering solutions from providers, we have also been told that it has been a process of self-reflection and learning um, by their side, by taking the time to really identify the key drivers of their success. And then on the other side, you have the solution seeker and there the benefit lays in not having to reinvent the wheel and looking at successful approaches and existing knowledge on, and building on that. Um, and taking the, the building blocks or solutions and replicating them in their own context. So essentially Panorama is a mechanism which motivates people to talk about their success stories and connects those with people who are seeking for inspira inspirational stories. So um, really this is, uh, this is our solutions, for solutions format. So every solution has these building blocks. They, they can be four or more or less. It doesn't really matter. And um, that's the only criteria we have for the solutions that they need to be composed of these building blocks. But other than that, solutions really can come from a broad range of approaches, methods, and tools. And we have deliberately designed them to be really broad and inclusive. So it's not at all a one size fits all kind of approach. Um, however, we have set three key criteria that need to be fulfilled in order to, um, to upload a solution onto our platform. And that is firstly, that they must be impactful. So the solution has had to have a proven, uh, measured or testified impact on the ground. So they have to be more than just an idea or the beginning of, um, of a project. And then secondly, solutions have to be scalable or replicable. So the solutions and specifically their building blocks, um, they, could, they optimally could be applied with slight modifications in another context, say in another sector, geography or social context, for instance. So really the aim is that you can take these building blocks from one place and apply them at larger geographic scale in another region. And then thirdly, they must be topic relevant. So solutions have to address conservation and sustainable development challenges in an integrated manner, benefiting both people and nature. So then if you have this solution at hand, where can you find them? Um, in Panorama, we really try to combine online and analog peer-to-peer -peer learning in order to promote these solutions. Um, but really, as I have mentioned, the online platform is our backbone and um, it is a searchable database of solutions which allows users to apply a wide range of filters and explore solutions within and across thematic areas um, and countries and regions. 
and Luisa will also show you this uh, website later on. Um, but other than that, we also facilitate face-to-face uh, face exchanges and workshops and trainings. And uh, even though in times of COVID-19, we have seen the high potential of online trainings, um, in the past, we have found that the matchmaking and knowledge, uh, knowledge exchange in person is really crucial to generate inspiring stories. And then we also have communications on solutions, such as our newsletters from Panorama, as well as publications, for example, uh, from our Blue Solutions Initiative, the uh, thematic community uh, coordinator of the marine and coastal um, portal. We have a publication coming out on marine nature-based solutions, um, as well as sustainable ocean economy. And um, we are also very active on social media, um, at Panorama, Adaptation Community, and Blue Solutions, and videos. And then lastly, we also have contests and awards. And they are used to identify um, a large number of innovations around priority themes. So for example, we have the Pathfinder Award um, organized by IUCN, UNDP, and WildArc. And that was given out during the COP CBD um, 14 in Egypt. So here you can see some of the organizations and voices from the providers that have contributed a solution to our platform. And um, you can see we have a range uh, spectrum of partners. So they range from government agencies, academic ag uh, and agencies or NGOs. Um, so it is a really wide and open network and uh, principally anybody can submit a solution. So you, do, you can be an individual and you don't have to be part of a wider organization. If you have something you would like to share and it fulfills these three kind of criteria that I have mentioned, you can submit it to our platform. So Panorama is constantly growing and uh, we are gaining more solutions and we attribute the success to three main factors. And the first one is um, our methodology and approach. So we really want to ensure that Panorama is more than just a learning platform. So it's really all about interaction between peers and knowledge exchange. And it's not only about uploading a solution, but looking for people who might take make use of the solution so matchmaking between between practitioners through events and webinars and also in-person meetings and um, so it might might be mostly digital but really really try to make it as real and personal as possible and then secondly it's all about collaborating and we really value and emphasize our partnership structure so we use synergies and complementary seeds um, between diverse partners with different expertise and different experiences to stay out of our comfort zone and get to know inspiring people and their stories. And then lastly, um, we recognize individuals and inter institutions. So as I have said, the platform is really open and inclusive. Anybody can submit a solution and anybody can access Panorama. It is free of cost and you can submit your, your best practices and solutions. So um, anyone can join. So um, thank you and let's focus on what works. I hope you now are maybe intrigued to visit our website and have a look yourself. Maybe you can see some solutions that you would like to make use of uh, or maybe even you want to contribute a solution yourself. And um, Luisa will guide you through our website quickly um, so that you can navigate it yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tilanka. Yes, as just introduced, I will um, quickly give you um, a quick tour through uh, the Panorama website. I'm going to try and keep it short so that we have um, sufficient time for our last input and then some questions and comments as well. Um, I hope you can all see my screen now. Good. Thank you. So um, what you can see here is the start page of Panorama. Um, you can um, then scroll down and already uh, directly see um, the main options to actually search for solutions, which is through uh, a thematic access where you can put in different filters. Um, you can look for a specific ecosystem. You can search for a theme. Um, or you can um, go for um, a geographic access. You can actually look at a map and see how the platform looks. Um, or finally, you can search by a challenge. 
um, where um, you put in a specific challenge. Uh, we have a challenge filter in the referencing and then see which solutions come up. Or you can just type in a keyword and see what shows if you don't really see any of the, uh, the filter options that we have available as suitable for you. You can find some news and latest developments. And as you can see, we're also on Twitter with Panorama. Um, so you'll also find the updates here. And what Tilanka already showed, you can also contribute your own solution. So you can put in a full solution, which takes in a little longer and requires more resources to be made available. Or you put up a snapshot solution, which is sort of like a very brief version of a solution when you say, we have some information, but not everything is available. But what we have, we would already like to share. So um, what you can then do, I just showed you this, um, is a search for a solution. You can go in and search for um, the different building blocks. Tilanka already introduced that. Or go to thematic community. Or you just say, I search for all solutions that are available, which are 646 at the moment. Um, here you can see um, these different filter options that you have. So you can go in and search for um, a region. Uh, let's say we look for Asia and then go in and look for a specific ecosystem, marine and coastal ecosystems, and maybe also specific challenge when you say, okay, I have ecological challenges. As you can see here, there's also a lot of like sub challenges um, that you can, you can either add all of them or you say, I, I unselect one of them and then only, we're only searching for the other ones. Um, then you can just hit search. Um, and it will show you the solutions that come up. In this case, 36 different solutions, which you can then look at either um, sort of the way I do right now with these little boxes, or you can also say, cool, I wanna see this more in a map view. Um, we've now uh, put in Asia, so we move more um, towards this side of the map. Um, or let me see if it loads. Yes, you can just have them as a list. I often find this kind of nice for my own search. Um, because we actually also use the platform a lot when people ask us for good examples. We also search on Panorama ourselves. So then um, you can go in and you can click um, into a solution um, where you then have a brief summary of the solution. You find all sorts of different um, useful tags, um, including um, different targets. Here we only have the IG targets, but some people also have added SDGs. Um, so there are a lot of like different filtering options and tags that also help you understand um, at a glance whether or not this is a useful solution for you. You also get a location um, to get an idea of where exactly you are. Um, and then you can learn about the challenges that um, people have been facing um, and the beneficiaries um, that have um, benefited from the solution. And then we come um, to really what is um, a core element of a full solution on Panorama, which are the building blocks. They really are a recipe um, for, um, for replication of a solution. So um, of course, not every solution will be um, rec replicable in uh, its entirety, but parts of it may be. So then you can actually just go in and look into the different building blocks where you then um, get a brief overview of what is meant by this specific uh, puzzle piece. Um, you get information on enabling factors and lessons learned, um, and you learn something more about the resources and can then easily return um, to the main page of the solution as well. Underneath the building blocks, um, you will get some information on how the building blocks are interlinked and interact with each other. Um, you can read about impacts, um, and then um, something that I always find very nice is a little story, um, which is often more of like a personal story by someone um, who experienced the solution and um, is now benefiting from it um, and just telling his or her specific view um, on what has been going on and how it has worked out and maybe also where challenges have been and how they've been dealt with. You will also find picture and video material, um, and you can find more information on who has provided the solution, additional resources, and the organizations that have implemented the solution. 
So uh, I'm going to stop here um, because now that you've heard so much about how Panorama works and what it is, we also um, want to talk a little bit about and we want to hear from someone who has actually uploaded a solution to the platform um, and has thereby become a solution provider. And for this, I would kindly ask Grama Kivugo um, from the Mikoko Pajoma Community Organization to kindly unmute yourself. Um, Rama and her team have a solution on blue carpet cr uh, credits financing on the platform. Um, as you can see, I'm showing it on my screen right now. And uh, Rama will guide us through this and also give us a little input um, on her project. So um, Rama, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Richa. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Mahma Kibugo. I'm the project coordinator to the Mikoko Pomoja project in Kenya. So today I'll be speaking about Mikoko Pomoja as one of the solutions highlighted in the Panorama platform under the marine and coastal solutions. So um, let me start sharing my screen. Um, Great, it's working. So to begin with, um, why Panorama? I would say that Panorama recognizes nature-based solutions for resource management, indigenous knowledge, local innovation, and best practices in marine and coastal management. Um, the gains that Mikoko Pamoja has been able to obtain from this platform are uh, visibility for Mikoko Pamoja, definitely a uh, capacity building from other solutions that have been highlighted on the platform, as well, as well as making it possible for Mikoko Pamoja to serve as a solution to other people out there. And so um, moving on to what Mikoko Pamoja is and what we've been doing so far and the progress that we've made um, in, in terms of the prospect that had been earlier suggested in the platform, uh, we met our upload in the year 2016. So currently being in the year 2020, there has been more of development or more of achievements for Mikoko Pamoja. And um, Mikoko Pamoja is a Swahili statement that means mangroves together. It is the first ever community-led project um, to engage in the conservation and restoration and protection sorry, of mangrove ecosystems through the payment, the sale of mangrove carbon credits. So mainly our objective as Mikoko Pamoja is to restore and protect the mangrove ecosystems. And we've been doing this through the sale of carbon credits where we are verified by the Plan B for organization through its standards to um, sell our carbon credits for 20 years. So basically the project was incepted in the year 2012. We began um, selling our credits in the year 2013. And so far we have managed to sell over 10,000 um, carbon, I mean 10,000 um, carbon credits. So the Kokopa Moja supports two communities that cover, that are able to manage 117 hectares of mangroves. We have one or seven hectares of mangroves um, that are natural mangroves and the rest being 10 uh, planted mangroves. So uh, the amount of carbon that we have been uh, accepted to produce in Naya by plant vivo amounts to 2,500 tons of CO2. So basically the money generated from the sale of these carbon credits, which we usually refer to as revenue, uh, goes through a specific benefit sharing structure. So we have 6% of the 100% that goes to the Association for Coastal Ecosystem Services. Uh, this 6% is usually used or kept aside and used after every five years for the validation process where an independent validator comes in to check whether what we've been reporting over the years has been correct or, or not. 
and then we have the rest of the 94 percent being divided into five percent that is used for office expenses 21 percent that is usually used for the community wages 36 percent this is used for um the various project activities inclusive of which it's the mangrove restoration program and the last 32 percent that is used to facilitate the community development projects so basically on the 32 percent this is usually done in a participatory manner where we consult the community on what need is most pressing to them at that particular moment so the main thing that we usually look at is the sustainability of the project suggested whether it's sustainable enough how long it's going to take them and how many people it will be um, affecting at that moment or in future years um, for the benefit of, of, of the entire community. So one thing that I failed to mention is that Mekoko Pamoja supports two villages. We have Makongeni and the Gazi village. Uh, we have approximately over 6,000 people in both villages. So the suggested, basically the suggested community development projects uh, should be conducive enough or efficient enough to support the needs of both villages. The, the projects can be different depending on what the people have suggested at that point. Uh, they don't necessarily have to be the same. So, so far, Mikong Pamoja has been operating for um, te over 10 years, if I may say. Sorry, we've been operating for eight years. Uh, that is, we started operation in 2012, and um, we've been able to contribute to various SDGs, such as the SDG number four, that is on quality education, SDG number six, that is on um, water quality and sanitation. Um, we've also been able to create jobs. Currently, we've been able to employ four people. These people are directly employed by the organization. So one, we have the project coordinator, and her assistant, and then we have two more scouts that are responsible for the day-to-day -day monitoring of the forest. So apart from that, we've been able to engage in eco some aspects of ecotourism where we have um, a boardwalk that usually welcomes in tourists um, for an engagement or a direct engagement with the mangroves the mangroves as well as biodiversity within the mangrove ecosystems. Um, as I said, we've also been able to contribute to education in that. We've been able to issue out books, school books uh, for the kids, for the students in the schools, as well as um, participate in the renovation of some classrooms or libraries or any facilities in the school. For the water and sanitation, we've been able to provide water points. These have really helped um, the communities in terms of accessing um, clean and safe water for daily use. And lastly, and most importantly, we've been able to restore degraded areas within Gazi and Makongeni through macro restoration. So among the prospects that, are, that were mentioned on the site or on the panorama platform were um, Mikoko Pamoja being able to replicate what it's been doing to other regions. So previously, uh, I believe in the year 2016, we had an engagement with um, patches from Madagascar who came in to learn more about Mikoko Pamoja and what we've been doing and basically um, the whole process of implementation from inception to actualization of the project, the challenges we've been going through. So we had, we had an exchange program with them. Um, we're looking into doing the same with patches from Tanzania, but I can say that the greatest achievement that Nikoko Pamoja has made so far is its extension into the Vanga Blue Forest project. This is a project that is four times larger than Mikoko Pamoja. Having Mikoko Pamoja cover 117 hectares of mangroves, Vanga Blue Forest 
uh, is able to cover 460 hectares of mangroves, which means that it is able to sequester more CO2 as compared to Mikoko Pamoja. So similar to Mikoko Pamoja, Vanga Blue Forest is accredited by the Plan Vivo organization, and it is verified to set over 6,000 tons of CO2 per year to the voluntary market. And it is also credited to this sell these credits for 20 years, starting from the year 2019. Other ongoing plans that Mikoko Pomoja has been able to engage in is um, the establishment of a locally managed marine area that incorporates seagrass. Um, we are looking into the inclusion of seagrass to community conservation in terms of bundling of the seagrass together with the mangrove carbon credits. So basically what we'll be doing, um, contrary to what uh, the benefit that we're obtaining from the mangrove ecosystems in terms of um, getting revenue through the sale of carbon credits, what we've been able to do so far is um, urge our buyers to contribute at least $2 per every credit that they buy from Plan Vivo, or per every credit that they buy from the cast. I mean, um, yeah, sorry, but per every credit that they buy from Plan Vivo. So if it means that someone is buying 21 credits, then depending on the price that one credit goes for at that particular moment, they are asked to add another $2 for that credit. This goes to the conservation and management of the sea grasses. Um, another thing that Mikoko Pomoja has been able to do is research and design our own efficient fuel stops, which will bring carbon savings as well as health benefits. Um, this will also wholesomely add to the reduction of pressure to the mangrove ecosystems. So the steps that we have made in the incorporation of seagrasses into mangrove conservation is we basically had our first consultative meeting in the year 2019. This was held in the month of December. And the main objectives to these meetings uh, were, one, to appraise on the past or present seagrass research in Gazi Bay, two, to introduce the concept of seagrass payment for existing services to the stakeholders, uh, three, to map community activities within and adjacent the seagrass meadows of Gazi Bay, and lastly, but most importantly, to ensure community support for the project and the proposed intervention. This was done in um, where different uh, um, stakeholders participated in the meeting called uh, most of the meetings we have, or generally all the meetings we have must be participatory in nature. So we had stakeholders from uh, facilities such as the Camfrey facilities, which has been um, providing Mikoko Pomoja with technical expertise over there since inception, together with members from the beach management unit, the Mikoko Pomoja team, and other related stakeholders. Uh, so, the conservation areas that um, the seagrass proposal is able to share is uh, to cover, sorry, is uh, one, um, what we were mainly looking at during the identification of these areas was, was there any um, signs of degradation that has been happening over the years? And this could be noted by um, the loss of seagrasses or the reduction in abundance of the seagrass vegetation. And another thing that we are looking for is the species abundance. And luckily, or, or if I may say, um, fortunately for us, we were able to, to find six, I mean, seven to eight species of the seagrasses in three different activity areas that it's Activity area one, activity area two, and activity area three. Um, and um, most importantly is the carbon content that is uh, found within the seagrasses. 
So we all know that mangroves are able to store huge amounts of carbon as compared to terrestrial vegetation. So when it comes to sea grasses, uh, sea grass ecosystems, uh, when you compare sea grass ecosystems and um, the terrestrial, ecos uh, terrestrial ecosystem, they are somehow competing in terms of the amount of carbon content that is stored in each ecosystem. And another factor that we were able to look at is the accessibility by community. This is especially important during the monitoring activities uh, in order to encourage monitoring um, or accuracy in monitoring. Um, we have to consider the tidal specifications of the area. So our next step will be the confirmation and demarcation of protected areas and finally the agreement on the benefit sharing structure uh, which is similar to what Mikoku Moja has been using over the eight years that it has been in operation. So um, just as outlined in the panorama platform, we have the Mikoko Pamoja building blocks. Um, the, main, the main ones that have been highlighted on the platform are the participatory forest management plan, the forest management agreement, um, carbon know-how through strong partnership, as well as the community environmental education and awareness. So basically what the participatory forest management plan is, it is um, it usually comes after a community forms a community the community forest association which develops the now uh, talked about participatory forest management plan after this um, the community signs an agreement that is known as the forest management agreement with the agency in charge of the forest and in this case this was the kenya forest service which is a government um, agency that has been given the responsibility to manage the forest. Um, so we have that. And then we also do have the project idea note, which is definitely necessary for the formulation of any project. Uh, you have to say what you want to do and the situation on the ground, how you're going to go about the entire process of um, bring in your nature-based solution, then you're also supposed to provide the project technical specifications, which are basically um, things to do with the amount of CO2 that will be sequestered and the amount of CO2 that has been released into the atmosphere without intervention of the project and such like things. And then you also have to hold multiple stakeholder meetings um, to encourage um, consultative sessions with them. And lastly, one should have the project design document, which is an overall document containing all aspects of the project from the scope to the location, to um, the technical specifications and the governance structure. This includes basically everything. So uh, for more information about Mikoko Pomoja and the uh, credits that we sell, you can access it through the links provided. Um, you can get us from the ACES website, that is the Association of Coastal Ecosystem Services, as well as the Mikoko Pomoja website and the Plan Vivo website. Um, I would encourage people to continue up putting up their solutions on the Panorama website. This has really helped me Coco for Moja, and I believe with time um, we are going to put in more of um, our achievements in it because, like you mentioned, our solution was uploaded on the website in 2016. We've been doing some current changes, there have been some changes done in 2020, which I believe are very essential to other people who are willing or ready to learn from the platform in as much as Mikoko Moja is. So thank you for your time. And uh, I would appreciate any questions addressed to me. Thank you very much, Rahma. 
Um, we are running a little bit over time, um, but I think it would be nice to at least um, address um, a few questions. Um, so I think um, we will dive right in um, with that now. Um, one question that has come in is linked to the EBA Tools Navigator. Um, people would be very interested in EBA tools suitable for local government planners. Would those also be included? Tanya, maybe you can say a word on this. So, yeah, so there are uh, tools that are relevant for the local and site level in the navigator. I actually had a quick look in the, in the navigator when I saw the question and I see there are at least 88 tools that would be relevant for local or site level. Doesn't mean they're exclusive for these scales, but they, they can be used um, for, for local planning. And yeah, these include tools related to helping users prioritize climate risks, analyze vulnerability at community level, or even tools to do, uh, to evaluate cost benefits of adaptation action. So they could be useful, for example, for some kind of stakeholder processes. So yes, there, are, there is a variety of tools and I encourage you to have a look at the, the navigator uh, on its Excel format, which I, posted the link on the chat and have a look at the tools we have there. Thanks, Lee. Okay. Thank you, Tanya. Um, then another question came in, which um, is linked to Panorama. Um, have you considered adding the eco DRR community to Panorama, such as through PEDER, the Partnership for Environment and Disaster Risk Reduction? Um, I would be happy to go ahead with this one, Tilanka, and if you want to add something, um, you, you do that. Um, some of um, the EBA solutions definitely have EcoDRR elements to them. So um, I think some of the solutions um, have been added to, for instance, uh, the EBA portal or the EBA thematic community. And maybe as an overall um, comment to this, we always try to identify um, whether or not we actually want to and need to establish a new platform or whether a solution or a group of solutions that comes up can actually be added to the already existing um, thematic communities because um, yeah, quite a few of them have overlaps and then solutions can already fit into um, different um, thematic communities. However, um, as Tilanka said, we do encourage um, new thematic communities. So if this is something that you would be interested in um, sort of having added to Panorama, um, we would definitely be open for that. Um, you can approach us and then um, we are going through this process right, right now with the nature culture um, community then um, there's going to be a discussion in the steering committee about this. Um, you would make suggestions for how this could work. You would collect um, uh, suitable examples. And then this can definitely be done. Um, so um, if this is something that um, could make sense, um, you are uh, welcome to approach us. I think um, from our side, um, we can definitely fit some um, EcoDRR solutions um, into the EBA thematic community, um, but uh, that's definitely not true for all. So it could be an option. Tilanka, would you have anything to add to this? No, I don't. I think that was okay. Perfect. Okay, then we have one more comment. Um, one issue we and our partners experience um, is the response time after one submits a solution to Panorama. In extreme cases, after we submit, the responses can take months to get advice and suggestions. Then in some cases, we no longer have capacity to respond or finalize the solution. Um, yeah, this is um, a challenge that I know has happened in the past. We are trying um, to always get back to people as fast as possible. Um, we do have experts who do the review of the solutions. Um, however, we also um, do them ourselves in the thematic community. So that's why sometimes it takes time. And um, it's, I guess, also important to add at this point that um, a solution when it's being uploaded normally goes through multiple review loops. So often we make we make suggestions for how an, a solution that has been handed in can be improved, um, then the solution provider adds to that and that process also often takes um, quite a while. Um, but um, apologies if this has happened and uh, we are always trying to um, get back to people as fast as possible. Um, 
Okay, let me see if there's anything else at this point. Um, I'm, I think this last one is also a question. Interested in finding out more about tools relevant for EcoDRR as my organization recently started an EcoDRR initiative based in the Caribbean aimed at building resilience to hurricanes. Tanya, um, I don't know if you want to uh -huh. pick that up, but this is more, more of a comment probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just a note that uh, we do have some tools for DRR. Uh, I know we have at least included the, um, an online course that was produced by the Partnership for Environment and Disaster Risk Reduction. And I know we have others that can be relevant for disaster risk reduction contexts. Uh, I see we have one on cities, relevant for cities as well. So we don't have too many. Uh, we would love to hear about more if you're involved through your initiatives. But uh, yes, we have at least a couple of them on EcoDR. Okay, thank you, Tanya. Um, I don't see any further uh, questions and comments at the moment, and we have also run over time with our session a little bit already. So I think this is a very good point to conclude and thank everyone for um, attending and for your questions. If you have any further questions or comments, you can reach out to all of us. Um, we've put our email addresses in the chat um, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. And uh, for the rest, I want to thank you all very much and have a good day and evening.